Right, so welcome to the live stream today. Very much excited for having you on our next discussion for the principles of taxation and advanced taxation tomorrow for the ICMA 2021 examination. And we want to go straight up into the Q&A. And uh, for those of you who are joining me on Zoom, you indicate by raising your hand and I'll bring you on, then you ask your question uh in that situation or you can put it in the chat for those of you who are watching on youtube you can put your messages in the chat or your comment in the chat uh on facebook you can put it also in the comment section i'm going to be reading all of your comments be specific directly with your question this is taxation and principles of taxation so specific with your questions and i'll bring you up and then uh you ask your question in that case so you are welcome those of you joining us on Facebook, you're welcome. Those of you joining on YouTube, also, you are welcome. What, whatever questions you have on taxation uh, in Ghana, I'm going to provide you with some strategies, some techniques, some issues that you need to look out for in the taxation exam. But most importantly, I want to provide you with some answers to your questions in that particular situation. So you... For those of you who are with me on Zoom, you indicate by raising your hand, I'll bring you on. Or better still, you put your questions in the comment section, and then I'll be answering your questions for you as well. Uh, you make sure that you mute uh, if you're not talking so that uh, we don't have feedback coming in because we are streaming on Facebook as well as on YouTube at the same time. Okay, so that is it. Let's see some comments already coming in. Yurita Rusev, you are welcome to the stream. It's been a long time since I heard from you. Yurita, I hope that you're doing well. Uh, and welcome to the stream today. Smash the like button if you join the live stream. It helps us a lot to promote the video so we can reach as many students as possible. Uh, so share the video as well with your colleagues. Let's get people coming up. Uh, advanced audit and assurance students just finished their exams. And so we will be having some of them also joining us uh, as we continue with our discussion. But let's begin the discussion here uh, in that case. Yeah, Halima on Zoom, uh, there was a question you were bringing up before I said, let me go to uh, set up our live stream. So you can come up if you are ready with your question, Halima, uh, in that case, on Zoom. If not, to, then I, I could bring somebody up. Okay, Isaac, I think your hand is up. You can come up. Sir. Yeah, Isaac. Uh, good evening. Good evening. How are you? I'm fine, sir. Uh, my, my challenge is with the structuring of the capital allowance. Okay. Most of the times, the, the pool is, is long. And it can't go on the answer sheet. So I mostly struggle with the structuring of the capital allowance. When you say the pool is long, do you mean length or wide? Like we have so many pools, like uh, first, second, third, and we have other uh, building, building one, building two, then we have other yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. tangible asset. So yeah. it becomes so... <laughs> Now, this is, the deal. this is the deal. So your question is on the structure. So this is the deal. If on the page you can have class one, class two, class three, it's okay. You can come on the next uh, maybe half of the page, depending on the way you are managing it, and do the four, five, or assets, four, A, four, B, that order. So we don't, it doesn't necessarily have to be in the same uh, horizontal presentation like that. No. If it is one, two, three, that can go there neatly presented, professionally assigned, then three, four can be in the lower end of your script or maybe on the next page, depending on how lengthy the question is. Does it make sense? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, so that is how the structuring of the capital allowance should be. So not necessarily bringing all of them there because when you try that, it's going to squeeze and it will be really messed up. So if it is three classes that can go there, put it there, then the other ones should follow either on the second half of the page based on the way the questions will go there or probably the next page in that situation. So that's it about that. Okay. All right. 
So any other questions, those of you are with me on Zoom, you indicate by raising your hand and I'll bring you up. Or if you don't want to talk also, you can put your questions in the comment section in the chat on Zoom, then I'll be taking your uh, questions in that case. Those of you joining us on Facebook and on YouTube, put it in the comment section, in the chat session, and I'll be able to answer your questions. Enyo Beck said, good evening, sir. Is withholding tax different from normal VAT? Yes, there is a difference between VAT withholding tax and normal withholding tax. There's a difference between the two. The normal withholding tax, it's on goods, services, works, and other incomes in that situation. So um, let me pull up my slide on that and then uh, maybe show you exactly what I mean by that. So let me share my screen. Let's get it picked up. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Okay, I guess it's coming up. Uh, coming, coming, yep. So let me share my slide with you. Now, this is a document I did for our students who are writing uh, taxation and advanced taxation. So a lot of the things that uh, are critical that you need to know are in this file. So I'm just going to this file to share uh, my thought with you on what you asked. Oh, got a lot of slides coming up. Yeah, so this is the issue about the traditional withholding taxes. So the withholding taxes can be on goods, services, works, uh, and all that case. And some are final withholding tax, and we have withholding tax on accounts. If you remember, the issue about the final withholding tax means that the tax person shall not include the income again in determining his chargeable income. But then withholding tax on account means that the gross income shall be included in the determination of the chargeable income of the individual in that case. So the traditional issue about withholding tax would have to do with uh, supply of goods and services exceeding 2000 supply of uh, uh, works supply of services and there are 3%, 5% and 7.5% withholding taxes respectively. And they, these are withholding tax on accounts, on accounts. So th that's that's the traditional withholding tax issue. There are rent withholding taxes, uh, there are properties, uh, residential properties, commercial properties, dividends at 8%, subject to the fact that uh, the person owns less than 25% of the company, but if the, comp the person owns more than 25% of the company, then the dividend tax will not be charged in that case. However, if it is a mining company, then that issue about ownership is breached in that case, in that particular situation. So that is a traditional uh, withholding tax issue. But then, for VAT administration purposes, the Commissioner General has appointed some VAT registered agents to be VAT withholding agents. And that's different from the normal withholding tax. So the way that the deal works is this. Let's say I'm a VAT agent, all right? Then I sell to you and you are also a VAT agent. Now, when I'm selling to you, probably I rendered a service to you and the service value is whatever the heck, let's say, whatever, let's say $2,000. Maybe we are in tax, so let me do Ghana cities here. Uh, 2,000 Ghana cities. Maybe let, let me uh, take it a notch. Maybe 4,000 Ghana cities, something like that. Then I charge you VAT on it so that at the end of the day, your invoice will look at like something like maybe 5,200. I'm just bringing up these figures, okay? 5,200. So that is the VAT invoice I'm going to uh, give to you inclusive of VAT. Like I was saying, some organizations, some institutions, VAT agents have been employed to take VAT at source at the end of the day. So the way that works is what I have here in my principal uh, small file here. This is how it works. So the VAT withholding, it's always 7% on the gross amount exclusive of VAT, on the gross amount exclusive of VAT. And that is very, very important in that particular situation, 7% of the gross amount. So if you are paying me, instead of you paying me 5,400, because you have VAT withholding agent, you will withhold 7% of the gross amount, 4,000. That's what we are saying here. And that will be deducted as a VAT withholding. Then if you are going to be charging me withholding tax also for the service that I've rendered to you, then 
the service that I've rendered to you will also be subject to uh, a withholding tax of 7.5% in that situation. So that is the idea about the difference between the VAT withholding tax and then the normal withholding tax. So the VAT withholding tax usually are collected by specialized businesses in that situation. And uh, the normal withholding tax is also there with a respective rate. The deal is that the normal withholding tax for goods, services, and works, if the sales or the value does not exceed 2000, then the, uh, the payer will not withhold any tax on it. But if it in the same year of assessment, it exceeds 2000, then the cumulative, cumulative sorry, amount shall be subject to a withholding tax of three, five, seven point five percent for goods, works, and services, respectively. So, if you ask about uh, withholding tax, uh, VAT withholding tax, and normal withholding tax, uh, that is the issue in that particular situation. There. So, for those of you who are joining on Zoom, if you have any questions, you indicate by raising your hand. I'll bring you up or you can better still put it in the chat box and I will read your comments for you in that particular situation. For those of you who are watching us on Facebook and on YouTube, you can put your questions in the comment section or in the chat box and I'm going to read all your comments as well in that case. Uh, Yerita Rusev on YouTube said, uh, I'm well, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Augustine A. Barton on YouTube said, I wish everyone of you best of luck as you prepare for the exams. Thank you very much. Um, let's see what else we have here. Okay, Enyo Bex said, thank you, sir. All right, you're welcome, uh, Enyo Bex. And then on Zoom, Kweku, uh, Johan is up. Yeah, you can come up. Good evening. Yeah, good evening. Yes, um, this uh, I want clarification on this um, VAT inclusive tenant. There was one question I saw. Um, are you supposed to do the twelve point five, and then afterwards you do the five percent to get which, the the net amount? Which five percent are you talking about here? Um, that is the um, the get fund and then the NHIL, the two point five, two point five. If you remember what we did, this is what we did. This is our pro forma for our computation. So we bring the value of the product, bring in NHIL, bring in the get fund. You get a gross amount exclusive of VAT. Then you're going to be calculating the VAT on that amount. So it means NHIL and get fund is inclusive on the amount on which you are going to be charging the actual VAT. So the 7% is going to be charged on the total figure. The 7%, which 7% are you talking about? Um, um, withholding VAT. Okay, okay, okay. The withholding VAT, yes. So it yes. will be charged on the uh, gross amount exclusive of the VAT. Okay. But what I was asking initially, mm -hmm. if the the figure given is VAT inclusive, yeah, and then you are supposed to work withholding tax on it, yeah. Now, to get the um, the VAT exclusive figure, are you going to calculate twelve point five VAT? Afterwards, you calculate five percent VAT to get no, the. No, no. Okay. You just do the 12.5. What will be left is the VAT exclusive, and that is what the withholding will be on. Then you charge the, the withholding tax on it. Yeah. yeah. But in one of the past questions, I don't know whether November or May, that? one of the past questions, they did both before charging, the, before charging the withholding tax on. Which year was that? Um, please, just a minute. I think it should be no November. November uh, last year. Uh, 
Uh, okay, please, I will, I, will, I will look for it and then I'll get back to you. Okay. But then, um, can I move on to another one? Uh -huh. Yes, that one, um, that one is with um, capital gain tax. Okay. Yes, um, the um, May 2020 question. Mm -hmm. I realized there was some income tax on rent collected by the estate agent. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, I'm listening. Uh -huh. Income tax on rent collected by estate agents. Was it was it put there to confuse confuse us? He said income tax collected by income tax on rent collected by estate agents. No, income tax on rent that is uh, going to be his own income. That has nothing to do with uh, the issue in relation to the chargeable gain that okay. you are going to be calculating in that case. Because if you are dealing okay. with the chargeable gain. It's going to be the value of the goods, uh, sorry, the value of the proceeds you have had from the sale, okay. from the sale, minus any cost that you have incurred so far in that situation. So whatever income tax that they have received on normal rent or whatever income tax that is supposed to be paid on the rent income they've received, that is not going to be having any effect ultimately on the capital gain tax computation. Okay. And then there is... Um... Something about government security as well in that same question. Mm -hmm. um, it's talking about the man selling government security and then um, incidental cost of this thing. With that question, are you going to calculate um, um, the capital gain tax, the charge about the capital gain tax? Uh, or you, you will not calculate. Uh, Again, I have not seen the structure of the question of what, what exactly is going on in that situation. Because uh, government securities, yes, they have, he has incurred costs in the acquisition of the securities. So if you are selling it for a proceed, at the end of the day, you are making a gain. And that gain is supposed to be subject to tax. But the only thing we know is that sometimes the uh, returns that are made on some of these securities may be exempted from uh, dividends uh, tax uh, in that situation or uh, so they will be exempted from tax so that it boosts the uh, individuals to be able to uh, purchase those securities. So maybe I would have to look at the structure of the question to find out exactly what is going on in the question. Okay. I don't know if probably the, I could bring the, it up. The VAT question eh, yeah. is um, it's May, May 2020. And what is the question about that? Um, so the question is um, the question is about withholding tax. It's about withholding tax, but then um, it's saying the following unstructured invoice has been forwarded to Adamu Limited from Asigri Limited a standard rated supplier. Then he has given the goods invoiced, VAT inclusive, at 3 million. The above transactions relate to payment for goods in January 2019. Compute the withholding tax payable by Adamu. And then um, you compute penalty payable, assuming Adamu doesn't file the withholding tax return 12 days after the due date. So they compute the withholding tax payable by Adamu. Because the goods was VAT inclusive, per their solution, what they did was to calculate 12.5 on the 3 million. And then the value was subtracted from the 3 million. And then they came back to calculate the the five percent on the balance of the three million minus the the initial twelve point five calculation that we made before um, 
charging the withholding tax on. So my question is that if it is VAT inclusive, do we have to calculate 12.5 out and then the 5% out? Okay, so um, again, it, it has to do with uh, presentation because okay. that same que uh, that similar question was also in the November 2020 uh, examination. And if you look at how that same question was solved, you realize that, uh, let me see if I can bring that one as well up. You re I think that is on the, but, uh, the, the, the where is that? Is that question five? No. The one I'm talking about is in question five. Okay. Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Question five of which year? May 2020, please. Okay. Let me see if I can bring that up. So it's five. Um, question five C. Question five C, okay. Okay, I think I've seen the question. Come I want to bring a slide up and uh, show you. Uh, I can, uh, I see a. Uh, that. So let's see. Okay, so question five. Five C. C. The following on structure. The following on structured invoice has been forwarded to Adamu. Da 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 da. Uh, goods inclusive of about three million. The above transaction relates to the payment for goods in uh, da da da. Okay, computer withholding tax uh, payable by Adamo Limited. Okay, Adamo received, was forwarded to Adamo from Asigra. Okay, so when Adamo is making the payment, you would have to withhold a tax. Okay, so the money is uh, VAT inclusive of 3,000. I, I compute the penalty mm -hmm. payable, assuming Adamo file withholding taxes returns uh, 12 days, it's coming up, 12 days after the due date. Yeah, so the issue is that the VAT without the friend is saying the withholding tax. So let me share my screen and bring that up. Uh, coming up. Okay. So the issue is that like I illustrated in this slide here, that assuming this is my service that I rendered to you. So this is the gross amount for the service. Then we added everything da 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 da. And uh, so NHIL, get fund, then the VAT itself. And so this is the price that I'm gonna give you. Yes. So we mentioned that the 7% uh, will be on the gross amount. The 7% will be on the gross amount. So if it is gross amount exclusive of VAT, then to the question that you are asking, it will be on that gross amount without the effect of the issue about, uh, your friend is saying, the, 
the VAT and the NHIL. And the NHIL. Get yes. Banned. So it has to be on the gross amount in that situation. It has okay. to be on the gross amount in that situation. Okay. There is the same question or similar question like that. I think in May, uh, this is what, what you just told this me. Is, this is May 2020. In November 2020, there is something similar to that. I don't know if I can bring it up. Let's see. Uh, where is my file? November 2020. Let's see. There was something similar like that. I don't know if I'm right. November 2020 is just... Um, is it a rejoice bar? Uh, I'm, uh, let me bring it up. Who is this? Kula Amos. Who, who is that? Are right, you people who are sharing the meeting idea? I don't even know this name. This name has never joined my meeting. So I, I, I'm just shocked. Uh, rejoice, bar, da, 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 costing 12,000, made a deposit. Uh, okay, okay. That will be a different context of question. Okay. I think that will be a different context of question. So uh, let me not go there. Oh. Or oh, it's rather... Uh, November 2019. There is there is one question like that, and there is a funny way they solve that question. Let, let me go to November 2019 and let's see if that has what I'm saying. Self-assessment, da, 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 da. Yeah. This particular question. Akofa Vignon. Akofa Vignon. Uh -huh. Akofa Vignon. I think we solved this question as well in class. And uh, yes. look at the way this one was done. Akofa Vignon, an equipment hiring company, raises an invoice in the sum of 500,000 Ghana cities in respect of hiring of equipment. So this is hiring of equipment. So if it is hiring of equipment, that is a service. And if it exceeds 2,000 cities, a traditional withholding tax of 7.5% has to apply. Traditional withholding tax before the VAT if, withholding will come in. If it, if it exceeds 2,000. If it exceeds 2,000. I mean, that is the traditional withholding tax. Hey, I right. thought the VAT withholding didn't have threshold. No, no, no. That that is I, that is why I said traditional withholding tax. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Traditional withholding tax. So if you look at this question, it says that uh, so that one that's, should be seven point five. Yes, that's seven point five for yeah. services. So if you look at this question, it says that. This supply excludes VAT of twelve point five NHI da 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 da. Then it says. Calculate the proportion of that that should be withheld by the agent. So that is question two. Um, B. What? B. Question two B. So yeah. we have the issue five hundred thousand. That's the gross amount, and it excludes NHI. Da 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 da. So question two B. Let's just jump to their solution. So look at what is going on here. And I want you to strike out the difference mm -hmm. on exactly what is going on. So you realize that in this question, they are bringing up the 500,000. They added yes, the 5% NHL and get fund, but they charged the withholding tax on what? The amount inclusive of the 5% NHL. Is it not a mistake? So... In, in May 2020, you did that. In November 2020, you did not do that. So sometimes you find out like exactly what, what, some, what are some of the things going on. And uh, there is no clear justification going up here. Because in May 2020, the way that is supposed to be computed is the same way. That you bring in the NHIL, the GET fund, then you calculate the VAT on the 525. Yeah. And November 2020, it was the same rule, da, 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 da. But the VAT rule had not changed. So you look at the same scenario, solve differently in one setting, solve another time differently. So it brings some challenges up. So this is what I want you to take. This is what I want you to take. As you go to the example, you realize that uh, the main withholding tax of 7.5% uh, let me bring out my cursor here. Oh, I'm opening ICA website. Okay. So it means I cannot map on this one. 
Okay, but I don't know if you can see down here, service withholding tax, 7.5%. Quick, your line is breaking. I don't know. So you can see that the main service withholding tax is charged on the gross amount. Whilst the 7.5 VAT withholding is charged on the amount exclusive of VAT, but inclusive of the NHIL. So this is what I wanted to take. And that is what yes. I explained to the you in right class. The right thing is that the, the tax... Yes. So this is what I wanted to take. The, uh, with the main withholding tax should be on the gross amount, okay? The main withholding tax should be on the okay. gross amount. Then the VAT withholding tax should be on the amount inclusive of the 5%. Okay. Yes. So that is what, if you go to the exam, and this is a common question the examiner brings, VAT and VAT withholding, VAT and VAT withholding. So if there is a main withholding, it should be on the gross amount, and then the VAT withholding should be charged on the amount inclusive of the VAT in that mm. particular situation. And because th that is what I explained to you in that case, especially when we're talking about the principles that I explained to you here. Let's bring it up. The principles, as I explained to you here, you realize that I mentioned that your uh, VAT withholding tax should be on the amount, on this amount, that is the gross amount exclusive of VAT, this figure. So meaning that the effect mm. of both the NHIL and then the GET fund should be included in arriving at what the withholding tax. So the traditional withholding tax should be on the main value and then the VAT withholding tax should be on the amount Exclusive of VAT, but inclusive mm -hmm. of the NHIL, da 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 da, in that situation. So that is what we're going to be going for in that case. Okay. okay let's thank see. You. All right. So let's see what else do I have here. Uh, please say the relief and the employment income. Are we supposed to use the new ones or stick to the old one? I don't know which one you mean by old one, but the reliefs you are using will be the relief that came into effect since 2020. And that is this relief. Hey, is my, I hope my screen is showing. Yeah, my screen is showing. So this relief, uh, the new one, 600,000, sorry, 600 Ghana cities by three. Uh, age dependent, social security, ba da 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 da. Like, so these are the rates you're going to be using in that situation. And uh, unfortunately, the CA has not come up with some publications on some of these things. But um, what we know is that if a law comes, be, comes to effect, uh, six months after the law comes into effect, uh, the examiner is going to be examining on using those principles or using those laws in that particular situation. So that is why we're going to be having that coming up in that case. Uh, the, Isaac. The, does it mean that? Hello? Yes. So like when it comes to uh, this new uh, adjustments made to VAT, I mean the 1% Okay, okay. Don't look at it at all. <laughs> <laughs> Don't look at it for your exams. That will be right, right. member examination. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, Sandra, I think your hand is up. Yeah. Hello, Isra. Yeah. Yeah. Please, I wanted to know who related parties are. Like in terms of in tax, uh, related parties and how related, their activities can affect revenue generation. Related parties are like the name suggests related parties. <laughs> okay, so uh, as per the you know this already from IAS 24, it is the same thing in taxation. Uh, related party transactions. The idea is that uh, related parties are simply organizations which are under the same directorship or the same ownership. 
So for instance, if we have group of companies and we have subsidiary A, subsidiary B, transaction that occurs between them is a related party transaction. Or better still, we have the directors of the company, direct, uh, transactions occurring between directors of the company and the company itself could also be, or will also be referred to as related party transaction. Now, usually what happens is that transaction occurring between related party transactions don't occur as though they are independent. So for tax purposes, when they, we are determining their taxes, we have to assume that the transaction is occurring between independent transaction or independent uh, parties so that the arm length principle comes in. So if for instance, uh, one division sells to another division, but sells the product to another person. So let's say for instance, let's say we have, uh, maybe we have a group of company and it have subsidiary A, and then it sells also to external customers. So let's say that for instance, the external customers, they sell to them $10,000, but to their subsidiary, they sell to them uh, whatever, let's say $8,000. When the tax authority comes and smells that it's a related party transaction, the accounts of the parent entity will be recorded this transaction as $10,000, as though it occurred between independent parties. That is what we mean by related parties and related party transactions and how they affect the computation of income tax liabilities. Does it make sense? Mm, yeah. You good? Thank you. All right. Yes. Isaac, your hand is up on Zoom. Bring it up. Hello, sir. Yeah, Isaac. Yeah, my question has to do with uh, employment. When, uh, when um, I have a challenge with payment to employees for uh, their servants and watchmen, I was okay. solving some question. They added it. Some they added it to the a uh, cash emolument, but other ones today added it to uh, the benefits in kind. Okay. So, okay. I don't know why there's some... Uh, yeah, I think in the two questions, there may be some uh, uh, thing coming up. If the money is given to the taxpayer, then that will be a cash benefit. But if the company pays it directly to the watchman or whatever it is, then that will be a benefit in kind, meaning that like more or less like the company employ the person for you in that particular situation. So that is, that is broadly the difference. So I don't know if you, you pay, go back and pay attention to the two questions, you realize that there may be a clause like that, that one, they pay directly to the person, the other, the bank, oh, sorry, the entity paid directly to the person. So that would be more or less like a benefit in kind in that situation. Does it make sense? Say so the, the, the watchman, the watchman was paid uh, directly by the company. Okay. So then the, the, the housemaid was also paid like that. But the watchman, the watchman's salary was added to benefit in kind. And then the housemaid was added to the, the, the cash. <laughs> some, of, some of these things, I mean, their treatments are a bit uh, controversial in that, in that particular situation. Um, we've seen a couple of uh, examiners report where, I mean, those things could be treated in that under cash emolument. Those things could be treated under uh, benefit in kind. Uh, but the deal here is that uh, one, one thing that you can take is this. If the company pays the person, paid to the taxpayer or the individual, then we can add it to the cash benefits directly. But if the uh, company pays the person directly, then you can put it under benefits in kind in that situation. I mean, uh, you can't go with the two. There has to be some one thing coming up. And one thing you can do is that because some of these things, I mean, they are not really clear. When you finish, you have to state an assumption that you used. I think I've told you guys this before, that when you are preparing 
the corporate tax uh, liabilities or income tax liabilities, you have to always state the assumptions that you are using. So if you state there assuming that uh, payment to the watchman is treated as benefit in kind, since the company paid directly to the individual bomb, you're going to be marked in that case. But uh, that is what you can take there. That is what you can take there. So if you receive the money, it should be cash benefit. If you don't receive the money, then it should be uh, benefit in kind in that particular situation. Just like if you are dealing with loans, uh, loan benefits uh, in that case. So that is what I would say in that relation. Once you do a treatment and that treatment is allowable, you just have to state why or on what grounds you did the treatment. And that will be validated and you will be marked in that case. Okay, thank you. All right. Yeah, Roland, your hand is up. You can come up. Yeah, good evening, Shra. Yeah, good evening. Yeah, my question is, um, in determining the total cash emolument, mm -hmm. I'm still not clear about the treatment of, let's say, Provident Fund and the employ empl employer's contribution of the 13%. Is, right. it, is it treated as a part of the, um, your friend is saying, total cash emolument or is treated and, and that benefit in kind. Okay. Now, the issue about the 13%, I think I've told you about it, that you could decide not to bring it at all in your working scope, right? Yeah. So yeah. let's take that one out. Okay. Now, the provident fund will be like indirect payments uh, mm. that they give to them in that particular situation. So okay. that will be more or less like a cash they are giving to them. So that is why we could treat that under cash emolument in that situation. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me bring up my pro forma on, on that as well. Let's see. Yeah, in your pro forma, it's under uh, indirect cash, but it is treated as part of the cash, total cash emolument. Yes. So it should be treated as, as that because it's, it's like a payment we are giving to them in yeah. that situation. And so, the, same, the same applies to the 13% the too. Yes, if you want to bring it up. But remember okay. that if you bring it in there, uh, so the, well, what you can do is you can just take it out, decide okay. not to bring it at all. Uh, in that case, if there is a provident fund, then you deal with it. But at 13%, okay. you can decide not to bring it at all. But like I said, the two treatments have been done by the chief examiner before in his report, including okay. it. Then another time, not including it. Including in it. Case. Yes, so you can decide not to include it and then you go ahead with your workings in that situation. Okay, sir. Thank you. All right. Uh, I see some of you guys now joining. You are welcome. If you have any questions, raise your hand and I'll bring you up in that case. Somebody is in my waiting room. I don't even know the person. I don't even know how the person got there. Jesus. Um, so if you have any questions, raise your hand, I'll bring you up. Uh, for those of you on YouTube and Facebook, put it in the chat or in the comment section, and I'm going to answer you in that situation. Um, and your Bex said, uh, please, the communication tax rate, is it 5% or 9%? That thing has been adjusted, over adjusted, under adjusted, greater adjusted, so I'm coming. Let me go to my slide on that communication service tax. I don't know. Let me bring it up. 7%. What? I think it's 7%. 7% now. Uh, let me see. My I, thought, I thought it's five. It was, I think this under is five, but I don't know whether it will take effect as you said. Yeah, so recently it has been brought to five. Um, yes. let, me, let me go to my slide on that. I think I, sh I should treat this under sundry tax issues. Trillium commission. Da, 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 da. Let's see. Oh. This thing should be somewhere here. And the other tax issues. 
because there was a rate that uh, we could go with because the new rate do not take effect. So there's a rate that we could go with in that case, recently in the, in the recent exams. Oh, I'll check, I'll cross check this later on, but uh, I can't get it here right now, but uh, I thought I could just pick it up. Should be part of my slide here, but. I think they should be nine if, if that is the case. Yeah, so because uh, previously it's just it was six, they sent it to nine. They yeah. and now they brought it to five. Yeah, yeah. So we can stay with that. What's that? Okay, let's is it full screen? Um, okay, so that is it about that. Carlos Amos, if the watchman is an employee of the company, then uh, it is benefiting kind. Okay. Okay, Carlo Amos, uh, who are you? How, how come you got my Zoom meeting ID and you are trying to join our meeting? Somebody trying to share our meeting ID with you, right? Also, how do we calculate fresh graduate allowance? I mean, those are part of allowances. I don't have those things off it, but they, sh they should be part of our slide in here. Uh, that's part of corporate tax liabilities. I think 1% uh, for people let me see if I can bring that up. Fresh graduates, 118. Uh, for those of you on Zoom, if there are any questions, you raise your hand, then I bring you up real quick. Or you put it in the chat and we take it from there. Uh, fresh. 20, 2020 November. Hello. Hello. Yeah, hold Hello? on. Hold on. Oh, this should be right under my tax planning topic. Challenge some of these rates. It's not everything that is in my head like that. Too. It happen that way. It makes my brain. Okay, let's see. Yeah, I think it should be on the tax planning. Probably I treated this on the tax plan and fresh graduates. Remember carryover of losses, very, very critical. For priority sectors, the carryover of losses is for five years. For non-priority uh, sectors, the carryover of losses is three years. And you gotta be careful about that as well when you're dealing with carryover of losses in that particular situation. Now, in case you're asking what are priority sectors, priority sectors are these as follows, as I'm showing you on my screen, agriculture, corn and textile, food processing, forestry, health, horticulture, mineral processing, oil and gas, tourism, utility. All these are priority sectors and uh, carryover of losses for them are going to be five years. Any organization that is outside these type of companies will be carrying over losses for a period of three years. So you want to make sure you understand that as well when dealing with uh, corporate tax liability. I think I wanted to bring that to your notice uh, as well. Sometimes, okay. I oh, know. Thought I had seen the fresh graduate stuff. Some of these things, if I'm looking for them like this, I can't see them. Unless I take my time maybe i could go to another question later on uh if there is anything i'll pick it up from there uh ella ellie said good luck to everyone tomorrow okay thank you very much ella ellie who is that winner okay so let's see um, any other questions, you come up with your question, then I'll answer you real quick as I try to get these things coming up. Yes, Isaac, come up. Isaac, your hand is up. Mm -hmm. Sir. Yeah. Please, uh, the fiscal policy aspect. Yeah. Well, it's as if the... <laughs> 
the ones in the video don't bring it to they bring any question at all. <laughs> <laughs> but, that's it, that's it. They brought uh, the street assembly common final, so I said, ah. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, so it, it, it's it, it's weird though. Uh, it's not that the one in the book they will not bring it. Uh, that question, for instance, like I didn't get the concept. That was last semester. Principles of taxation you're talking about, right? Yes. That's principles of taxation. Uh, yeah. I myself, I was like, okay, what context was that? But I mean, where, where, where is that question? Yeah, this question. It says financial responsibility is a core component of decentralization. If local governments are to carry out decentralization functions, the, the, the issue is that centralization and decentralization is part of fiscal policy. So it is in the right sense to bring it up. Because when it comes to managing the economy, the issue about fiscal policy Governments cannot do everything from the central government. So there has to be some decentralization. So if you look at my book uh, and look at the chapter on, uh, your friend is saying, fiscal policy, I spent some time to talk about centralization and decentralization because that concept is, is part of fiscal policy. Just that, I mean, nobody would think that common fund and those things could be coming up. But the concept of centralization and decentralization, I mean, it's part of it's part of fiscal policy. It's part of fiscal policy. So they said state four functions of the district assembly common fund. I mean, if you're a good PSA student, I mean, you should be able to state some of these things here. <laughs> Just that you won't even see it coming. That's that's one of those things that you you will not see it coming. In that case, um. Sunrise, your hand up, or is the old one something like that? Okay. All right. Uh, so, any other questions for me, please? Any other questions for me? Uh, on YouTube, what am I having? Uh, Ishira, uh, Ishira, yeah, the rate is not a problem. How to know the percentage of fresh graduate is what my problem is. Yeah, that is what I'm trying to figure out. It's in my slide. I don't have that thing of it. I have a lot of things in my head. Not everything I have offered. So the fresh graduate rate, it should be, it should be somewhere, but I just can't find it in my slide. That's sometimes some of the things that happens. It should be somewhere, 118. The fresh graduate thing. Oh, uh, okay. This capital allowance. Let's see. Let's see uh, if I can get this in the next sixty seconds. Clock ticking. Clock ticking. Clock ticking. Should be. Should be somewhere. Yeah. This is it. I knew I could get it. So this is it. So this is the idea about the fresh graduates issue coming up so if the workforce of the company is one percent up to one percent of fresh graduate i mean ten percent of their salaries will be coming up above one percent but below five percent uh we're gonna be having thirty percent of your salaries coming up anything above five percent fifty percent of their salary will be a further issue in relation to that. A further issue in relation to that. So that is the idea about that. I think someone was, is also putting it in the chat. Okay, so uh, I, Isa Abdul Haviz, it's also putting it in the chat for you. So that is the issue there. Thank you, uh, uh, Isa, for bringing it up. Kindly touch on capital allowance, especially where the capital where the written down value is less than the CA charge. I don't understand your question. No. If you say the written down value is less than, how can the written down value be less than the capital allowance charge? It's not possible. It's not possible because uh, if the assets uh, in the pool, it's having uh, a carrying amount 
and maybe it's on a straight line and you are doing it on the original cost and you realize that the capital allowance charge is more than the written down value, then the written down value becomes the capital allowance, if that is the context of the question you are asking. So the written down value becomes the capital allowance because you cannot grant capital allowance above the written down value of the asset. So if the capital allowance you calculate it is more than the written down value of the pool, that means the pool is no more, then the capital, the written down value of the pool becomes the capital allowance that you grant. And where you sell the pool and the proceeds is more than the written down value, then the balancing figure is added to the income of the company and tax at the corporate tax rate. If the proceeds is less, then what is gonna happen is that the loss will be uh, recognized as a, an additional capital allowance granted to the entity in that case. So that is the idea about that. If that is the context of the question you were trying to ask about capital allowance, that's the issue there. That's the issue. Right, so any other questions uh, for me real quick? Uh, Isaac, is your hand up again? Uh, or is the old one? Yes, yes. Okay. So my, my, my last question is about a permanent uh, establishment. Okay. Uh, the, uh, I saw a question like that. You are asking what constitutes a, a, a permanent establishment. Okay. Uh, the constitution of a permanent establishment, like we mentioned, has to do with where an entity has an operation in the country or it has a division or a branch in a country. And uh, it should be a branch that is operating its business. But when the thing is just at the preliminary stages, maybe they are just doing testing of the products, that one is not a permanent establishment. So the race, uh, that one is not a permanent establishment. So the operation should be active, working, and uh, fully grown. And then, so anything that is about testing of the products, conditioning of the products, that should not be considered in that case. Let me see if I can get to you the context there. I think it's one of the questions in the kit, I guess, uh, something like that. What constitutes permanent establishment? Let me see if I can get the context uh, of that. But anything that relates to uh, preliminary, sorry, preliminary uh, preparation, it's not a permanent establishment. So a permanent establishment is a place in a country where a non-resident carries on business. Very important. Carries on business. Number two, a place where a person has or is using in installing substantial equipment or substantial machinery. That is also a permanent uh, establishment. So you are carrying on business at a place a non-resident uh, person carries on business, number one. Two, a non-resident installing substantial equipment. The word there is substantial equipment. Then number three, a place in the country where a person is engaged in construction, assembling, installation project for 90 days or more, including a place where a person is conducting supervisory activities in relation to that project. So... All these are permanent establishments. Okay, so it's a place a non-resident person is selling at. It's a place a non-resident person is installing uh, substantial equipment. It's a place where uh, a, a non-resident person is engaged in the construction or assembling uh, of projects for more than 90 days or more. So all these are constituents or what constitutes permanent establishment in that particular situation, in that particular situation. So that is what you can say there about uh, permanent establishment. Okay. okay, thank you. All right. Uh, well answered, but kindly give uh, what? Kindly give uh, 
illustration of what you just explained about the capital allowance. Uh, maybe, let's see. This is what I mean. You know that when you're dealing with capital allowance from class one to three assets, straight line method on the cost. Four to five assets, reducing balance method, da, 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 that kind of thing. So if you're dealing with class, class one to three assets, you know that the capital allowance should be charged on the cost of the assets. So let's say that the written down value of the asset is whatever. Uh, let's say 12,500. Then let's say the cost of the asset is uh, whatever. Let's say 50,000. Let's say it's a class two asset. So if it's a class two asset, what's the percentage? 30%. Can I have 30% of 50,000? It looks like 15,000, I guess. Yeah, so you realize that if you do capital allowance here, it's 15,000. Now you cannot charge a capital allowance of 15,000 if the reducing balance of the asset is 12,500. So you charge the 12,500 as the capital allowance for the period under consideration. That is the issue about that. Hey, sorry. Somebody is correcting me. <laughs> Did you say class one? No, no, no. Class one to three is reducing balance. Thank you, Nana. Class one to three is reducing balance. Me and Kasa may bon. Please, oh, don't take this one in the exam. Ishira is bon, giving you bomb here. Class one to three is reducing balance. Thank you, Nana. Uh, four to five is a straight line method. Is a straight line method. So if you check, if this is a four to five asset uh, in that situation, you cannot charge capital allowance more than the written down value of the assets. That's the concept we are establishing here. So you just, if it is 15,000, I mean, how do you take 15,000 if the value of the asset is just 12,500? So you just take the 12,500 as the capital allowance for the period under, under the uh, scenario. So that is the issue about that. If you ask for, uh, an illustration in that case. How can I, how can I do such a bump? This one is called big bump. I have capital allowance also here in this slide. Da, 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 da. Yeah. So yeah, four to five straight line da, 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 reducing balance. So that should be the correct thing. Okay. Any other questions coming up? Those of you on Zoom, those of you on YouTube, those of you on Facebook, if there are any other questions, you bring it up real quick. Like I mentioned, a number of things you need to understand is uh, the issue about treatment of, I mean, those of you are with us on Zoom, with me on Zoom, I mean, we've mentioned a number of things that you need to uh, really focus on, treatment of financial cost, financial gain, treatment of interest expenses, using the thing capitalization, concept i mean if you go through your principal book uh we have the rules established there under corporate tax liabilities uh dividend charges the, the the treatment of all those things in that particular situation then when it comes to dealing with the corporate tax liabilities i made mention of the fact that you need to take into consideration the location um the uh, type of business that we are dealing with i mean all these things are uh, critical principles that you need to have at your fingertips in that situation. And uh, for level three students, when it comes to treatment of financial cost and finance, financial gain for mining and oil exploration companies, you know that treatment is going to be different from traditional companies, which is the uh, level two students where we do the adjustment, 50% of the financial uh, uh, adjusted chargeable income, da, 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 those things. So you want to make sure that Gee. You want to make sure that, I mean, you understand all these principles very, very well uh, in that case. And uh, that is it. On on face, on YouTube, I'm getting a comment coming in from Isa. Please say, is the station of insurance company examinable in principle of taxation? Nope, not to my knowledge. You're going to be dealing with traditional companies usually. So it is not 
something that you should look at. What's wrong with my laptop? Okay. So that's it about that. Um, any other questions for me, please? Any other questions for me that I want you want me to share my thought on? Uh, let's see. Okay. So like I say, like I tell you all the time, uh, to increase your chances of passing the examination, corporate tax liabilities, it's, it's going to be there, level two students first. Corporate tax liabilities, know the principles, the allowances, da, 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 treatment of the various items coming up in that case. And you know, specifically some of the things that I've mentioned there under that. Income tax liabilities, we know that that is also going to be there, another 20 mark area in that case. Then the issue, whilst you're doing corporate tax liabilities, capital allowance should be on the side in there. Uh, chargeable gains, we know that it's going to be there. Make sure you get the principles about gift tax, what, what, what should not be included in the gift tax or what is not subject to gift tax. Like my wife buys me a beautiful uh, Rolex watch. I'm not supposed to pay any gift tax on that one. Uh, in that situation, but then if you receive the gift in your employment, then it shall be included in the determination of the income tax uh, of the individual. If a business also receives a gift, the fair value of the gift shall be determined, and that should be also included in the total chargeable income of the business for the year under consideration. And uh, these are some of the things that you need to understand. Then the concept about chargeable gain, remember that, uh, yes, even though when the person sells the product or sells the goods, uh, the person is subject to pay the tax of 15%. If it is the same basis year of assessment, the person uses the money to acquire a new assets, that means the person is not going to be paying the VAT and it is part of, uh, sorry, the tax. And that is part of uh, tax planning sorry, measures, and that will be for level three students taking it in that particular uh, situation, taking it in that particular situation. And then, so that is it about chargeable gain and all of that, those things. Every semester for the last semester, for the last three exams, we know that uh, there has been questions around that. Then issues about VAT and then withholding tax. Uh, regular thing you need to understand the principles there uh in that case and you know specifically the things that you are supposed to uh focus on there so once you get across these four key areas i mean these are the four key areas you don't want to joke with but apart from these four key areas we have the fiscal policy uh coming up we have the tax administration uh coming up and then we have the issue uh, in relation to the national pension uh, scheme, the three-tier pension scheme uh, in that situation, also there in that case. But the core areas that you need to position yourself, corporate tax liabilities with capital allowance, income tax liabilities, chargeable gain, VAT, and then withholding tax in that situation. For advanced taxation students, we've mentioned this already, uh, tax planning, whether I like it or not, it's waiting for you in the exam or tax implication of transactions, whether I like it or not, it's waiting for you in the exam hall. So tax implication of uh, transactions, that is going to be there. We've, I've shown you uh, that a dozen times uh, in the structure of the exams in that situation. So tax planning, tax implication, all those things going to be critical there. Then the issue about dealing with corporate tax uh, liabilities going to be there in that case. Then mining and oil exploration, you know that you're going to be having questions on that. And remember, I think during our last meeting, we solved some questions about how those did that, uh, costs are shared. If you're dealing with additional carried 
interest. You are dealing with additional participating oil, oil entitlements, da 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 da. How you share the various costs that are going to be incurred. You must make sure that you understand those principles very very well in that uh, situation as you go into the exam hall. In that case, then certainly uh, the issue about communication writing of memos letters their purposes and all that uh definitely we're going to be having questions surrounding them then i said that there's going to be some level two issues that examiner will throw in there between three to five marks in the exam hall for you so that you'll be able to find out what exactly you need to do uh in that particular situation so make sure that the issues about that then the anti-avoidance uh, encumbrances and all those things, uh, income splitting, uh, transfer pricing, um, what else we got there? Thin capitalization, all those principles, you want to make sure that you understand them. Now, you got to be careful here because uh, the issue about tax planning is very critical, but there are rules that are there that prevent individuals from really exhausting the tax because for instance interest is tax deductible but then to prevent people from harassing that law there is an anti-avoidance that is where thin capitalization comes in so that we will cap your loan to three times of your equity remember we said that equity is your stated capital and then income surplus or retained earnings equity is stated capital and uh, income surplus or retained earnings Please note that where the entity issues bonus shares, please listen carefully here. When the entity issues bonus shares and the examiner asks you the tax implication of the bonus shares, there has to be a withholding dividend of 8% on that because you are supposed to give them the dividends so that you tax them a VAT, in the, sorry, a, a withholding tax, but you decided to give them shares rather. So if there is movement between the income surplus or the retained earnings to the share capital of the business, then there shall be a withholding tax of 8% that is gonna be charged in that situation. Then also know that private companies with ownership less than four, if they decide not to pay themselves dividend for a number of years, the commissioner general can come and say, hey, we ain't gonna do that. Uh, how can you say you're not paying yourself? All right, for the last five years, whatever profit you've made, bring this percentage of that as a tax. So private companies, I mean, they could be called upon. Uh, if they decide not to pay any dividend, there is a tax implication of that. And this is for you level three guys. I mean, the bosses, you people are going to be thinking in that big spectrum. I mean, th these are uh, really not for the teeth of the level two students. I mean, the level two students, their teeth is not that matured to chew those things. But you level three students, I mean, you're gonna be chewing those things because these are the tax implications of the transactions in that situation. And then if there is a change in ownership uh, or there is merger, the tax implication of those arrangements, I mean, these are all tax implications of transactions in that case, or somebody going into agro processing as compared to going into a free zone enterprise. You must know the tax implication of all these things. Again, these are level three staff, level two people, close your eyes, close your ears, because that is not for you as well in that case. So should I go to uh, 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 agro processing or should I go to a free zone enterprise? And you must know the tax implication of these entities and these organizations uh, in that situation. Then the issue about tax evasion and tax avoidance. This is value, sorry, valuable for both level two and level three uh, students. Tax evasion is an illegal act. Tax avoidance is a way through which a taxpayer reduces his tax uh, burden through effective tax planning. So the ways through which a taxpayer reduces his or her tax burden through effective tax planning is tax avoidance but then tax evasion is where you say you won't pay tax so you receive a gift you decide not to pay the tax on the gift that is called tax evasion uh in that particular situation there so you must understand the difference between the two uh there uh in that case then when it comes to the tax planning please know that this is also for both level two and level three issues about the entity variable 
issues about the um what else is there entity variable what else we got um activity variable location variable the time variable i mean all these are tax planning measures in that case so sole proprietorship businesses are tax different from taxation sorry partnership businesses remember partnership businesses are not subject to tax it is the partners of the partnership business who are liable for their tax purposes uh when it comes to the uh, location variable companies that are located in accra and tema are going to be taxed differently from uh, companies in other regional capital or other district capital in that situation. Then activity variable, depending on what you're doing, you could be taxed differently. That is why agro processing companies will be taxed differently from hotel uh, companies that are in the hospitality industry uh, in that situation. Then the time variable where the taxpayer deems it that, oh, deferment of tax liability today in the future, it's better in that case. That is where issues about uh, what I mentioned in relation to the capital a lot, capital gains. So let's say I bought a land, then I sell the land and I'm supposed to pay, let's say I bought the land for say $10,000 and I sell the land for say $15,000. Uh, maybe I didn't incur any cost. So I'm making a gain of uh, $5,000. On this $5,000, I'm supposed to pay 15%. I can decide that I'm, I ain't going to pay that. I'm going to just use the money to acquire another property. What I've done is that I'm deferring the tax into the future in that particular situation. And like I tell you all the time, this is how the rich actually don't pay uh, uh, taxes legitimately. And they keep on building wealth and the poor keep on paying the taxes and they will use it to provide you with social amenities for your own money and you still struggle, but the rich keep on getting richer and they pay less amount of tax. It is called tax planning mergers. So these are uh, some of the things that you need to also uh, pay attention to as you are doing your final revision and trying to put the pieces together uh, in that particular case. Um, Fauzu on Zoom, I think your hand is up. Uh, okay, on foreign fees, like foreign permanent establishments. Uh-huh. Yeah, please. Are there specific tax implications or rules governing that? Are there any what? Like, I mean, I just need the principle, the tax rules governing foreign fees. Uh, uh, what, what you are saying is that now a foreign permanent establishment is a... It's a Ghanaian uh, establishment where uh, a resident, where a resident has that permanent establishment in that country. What's going to happen is that the person will be liable to pay taxes as per the country's codes or as per the country's principle. Where the Ghana has a double taxation agreement with that country, then the business shall be able to claim uh, a double tax relief on the tax that they have paid in that foreign country. But if Ghana has no tax liability, then the total amount they will remit to this country will be uh, subject to the total income tax. Just like how if there is permanent establishment in Ghana, their expatriated profit is subject to a withholding tax of 8%. The same way, if you have a, a, an establishment in someone's country also, they will charge you. But the issue is if there is a double taxation arrangement or treaty between the two countries, Ghana and the other country, then the company, when remitting their money into this country, can claim a tax relief on the tax that has been paid in the foreign country in that case. So that is the issue about uh, foreign uh, permanent establishment. Does it make sense? All right. All right. Then uh, again, on, on transactional net profit margin method. Of I mean, of transfer pricing. I don't get it. Uh, let's see if I can bring that slide up. You said what? Transactional no, net profit margin method. Who can I bring that up? Let's see if I can bring that up from my slide. Mm, -da 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 -da. Where could that be? Could be in my slide here. Let me see if I can bring it up. I should have it somewhere here. 
that's under transfer pricing. Whew. Mm. Okay, I guess I see. Let me see if I can bring it up. Oh, tax questions. No, advanced taxation. No. Advanced taxation 24. Oh, sorry. Let's see. I don't know if I have my requirement to that end. Okay. Let's see if I can bring it up. Okay, what do I have here? Comparable on control, resale price, cost price. What is it that you ask, uh, Fauzu? Transactional, I guess. Is Fauzu gone? Transactional net profit margin method. Transactional net profit uh, margin method. Now, this has to do with where you are looking at the net profits that you are making. So this is the concept. Uh, we are looking at the net profit that we will make. Should we, so let me pull up uh, from the slide here. Uh, where is it? YouTube uh, taxation. So this is where you are looking at, okay, so this is what happens. Let's say we have the entity in question here and we have its associates coming up here. And then we have the third party coming up here. Uh, what's going on? Give me a moment. So this is where you are asking yourself, okay, the entity selling with its associates and then third parties. At the end of the day, if we sell our goods to the associate, what's the net profit we are making on it at the end of the day? And then if we sell our product to the third party, what is the net profit? That is the idea about the transactional net profit. Uh, margin method coming in so it's about it's uh, it's about comparing the net profits of the taxpayer arising from a non arms length uh, transaction with a net profit realized in an arms length transaction from a similar deal so i mean with our associate we are selling the same thing to them if it is car car the same specs uh, car car the same specs but if we sell to our associate what's the net profit we are making if we sell to the third party, what is the net profit we are making? That is the idea about the transactional net uh, profit margin method. Comparing the net profit we are making, if we sell to the associate as compared to if we sell to uh, the third parties in relation to that. And the idea here is that chances are the entity is going to be making less net profit on its associate, but more net profit on it or on third parties or uh, more net profit on the associates and less net profit on third parties. It all based on the policy that the organization is choosing for the transfer pricing. For instance, if the company is in a, if, if the associate is in a jurisdiction where expatriation of profit is pro forbidden or the expatriation of profit is at a high rate, what's the, uh, entity could do is that they could sell goods to that particular associate, but they would charge them more than a reasonable price. So that on that deal, they could make more net profit. So that the excess net profit they are taking will be more or less like their expatriation of profit. 
However, if they are selling the same thing to another company, which they are not associated with, they'll be making less net profits about that. So in discussing the idea about transfer pricing, it depends on the position of the uh, entity selling. But what is going to happen at the end of the day is that uh, it is about how much net profit are we making if we sell to an associate as compared to how much net profit are we making if we decide to sell to a third party. That is the difference between uh, these two in that case. So that's the tran transactional net profit margin. Uh, what else do I have? Expenses recorded when incurred, right? But if it wasn't applied as a deduction in the financial year bill, is the, I don't understand your question. No. Is the expenses allowed in which, you, oh, if someone gets fees for setting up a discretional trust to form a business and is invoiced in the current financial year, but say he doesn't pay the bill for two weeks, which is now next financial year, is the expenses al Oh, okay. I, I don't get a context of your question, but when it comes to dealing with tax issues, there are two things. We have the cash basis and then the accrual basis. What happens is that usually businesses are going to be using the accrual basis whilst uh, individuals are going to be using the cash basis uh, in that case. The issue here is that what it means is that businesses will pay tax on income they have earned, even though the money has not been received. So usually businesses are going to be applying their accrual basis for accounting for their things. But individuals, it, even though the transaction has taken place, you'll be liable to pay the taxes on cash basis. But that's the general rule available. However, there are cases where the Commissioner General will recommend that an individual should account for a certain uh, income under the accrual basis. But generally, these are the two bases that we have. The cash basis, usually for individuals, for uh, tax purposes, rec uh, recognition of their income. But for businesses, the accrual basis is going to be coming up in that particular situation. But like I said, even though these are general rules, um, the uh, uh, Commissioner General could select or could let an individual apply whatever they have to apply in a specific scenario in that case. So with your question, uh, once it's a business and uh, the expenses is incurred, it, it will be allowed as an expenses in the year that it is incurred in that case, unless otherwise, yeah, it will be allowed in that year. So that if in that year they make losses, then that loss could be carry forward for five years if they are a priority business or three years if they are a non-priority business in that situation. So that is the answer to the question there. Chosichama, Chosicha Chado. I don't know what name is that one. That's a big name there. I can't even pronounce the name. So that is the issue about that if I answered you right uh, in that case. Right, so these are some of the issues that you need to uh, understand and uh, have at your fingertips as you go into the exam hall. Tax principles are quite a lot, but the good news is that they are not confusing, right? So it's not that one person says this, that, that, that. no, no, no. I mean, it applies. Once the scenario is there, it applies. So as always, what you want to do is that read a question carefully, understand the requirements of the question, and know exactly what you are expected to do in the exam hall. Once you know what you're expected to do, please don't jump to conclusions. Sometimes there is a trick. Maybe you read a preamble now, you say, oh, this one, the financial cost, financial gain will apply. No, you got to be careful about exactly what is going on in the question. And sometimes the examiner may do a lot of the workings for you that you are not supposed to even do any workings in that case. So you got to be paying attention carefully on the, the actual requirements that the examiner is asking you. Then you can answer the question uh, in that case. What you want to do is, like I say all the time, read through the questions well. Start with what you can do best first. Uh, as always, if there are theories in there, which there will be, do not write anything in your answer booklets because 
maybe the last time somebody said she will bring it to me so that I'll mark. <laughs> so don't write anything in your on your question paper, sorry, on your question paper. Let every solution be in your answer booklet straight up uh, in that case. And if it is possible for you to plan your work, the first page or the second page in the answer booklet could be your work plan where you write your key points there. Don't write anything on the question paper because if you forget and it's on the question paper, you and your house will mark it. But if you have put it in the plan or in the planning sp space and you have forgotten, no P, it's in the answer booklet. The examiner will still mark that for you. Yes, you will not get a full mark because probably you are supposed to explain the point, but you did not explain and that is all in relation to that. Now, let me give you an example of what I mean. Let's say you see a question on, uh, how do we call it? Uh, variables of tax planning and you know there is entity you know there is uh, and this is level two and level three that's why i picked that up uh, you know there is entity you know there is location you know there is activity you know there is uh uh location entity activity whatever so don't write it on the question paper so in your answer plan you could put those things there so if your answer plan you put that there maybe question 5b whatever it is you put it there. So maybe the pressure catches you and you're able to come and explain them later on. I mean, you've put the points there. The examiner will mark it and you will get some coins marked for that. And by virtue of the fact that you plan your work, you've listed the points down. You didn't explain it. You'll get a mark for that. It's better than having it on your question paper and you come out and you are like, oh, oh, I wrote it on my question paper. I didn't transfer. Okay, we will mark it for you in the house. Okay, I'll mark it for you and I'll score you pass mark. Then you see whether it will reflect in your ICA marking scheme. So that is the idea about that. That's what I mean by the planning style. It may not work for everybody or not everybody will be excited about it uh, because sometimes some of the things, even if you don't plan, you can just write them up straight up. Whatever it is, just make sure that you attempt with what they can do best first in that particular case. And I think that you should be able to go in there and uh, crush the paper and pass. I always say that principles of taxation, advanced taxation exams are the simplest because I mean, the rules are there, you follow the rules, you present it. And there is not gonna be any trick here. There is no trick in taxation. There is no, all you have to do is pay attention to the requirement and find out what exactly is going on, spend time to read all the questions well, and actually saw what am I being asked to do. And you should be able to go through it. They should be able to go through it in that case. So that is it about that. Uh, I'm gonna be ending around here today. And uh, you know what you do? If there are any things you want me to share my thought on again, you can send it to me on WhatsApp directly and I'll be able to uh, assist you with that in that case. So that is it about that. I'm going to conclude around here. For those of you watching on Facebook and YouTube, yesterday after my live stream, some people were sending me a message about uh, things that I don't even have a clue about. So please don't send me anything. Uh, that's all I can share with you on the live stream uh, in that case. So that's it. I'll see you when? Maybe July. For those of you who are graduating, au revoir, mes sweet. For those of you who are not graduating, we shall continue in July. So that is it. All the best. And I'll see you, God willing, some other time. Bye-bye. Thank you.